Good evening, and welcome to this webinar, When in Our Music, Listening to Jazz. This is our fourth episode uh, of, the se uh, of the series, When in Our Music, of season one. My name is Christopher Wells, and I'm the director of music at Christchurch Cranbrook, and I'm one of, uh, and I'm one of tonight's hosts. And my name is Nathan Costa. I'm the Assistant Director of Music here at Christchurch Cranbrook and the Liturgist. Uh, tonight, we will explore jazz, how we listen, how we appreciate and interpret the genre of jazz music. As we start tonight's program, I'd like to point out to our viewers one of the features of this technology of the Zoom webinar with which you may be already acquainted. There is a Q&A uh, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in which you're able to offer some questions um, to our panelists. Uh, we'll be monitoring that over the course of the evening. We'll have some dedicated time at the end, uh, but feel free to send your questions um, as they arise. Before we get started, I'm going to offer a prayer from the Episcopal Church's Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. O God, whom saints and angels delight to worship in heaven, be ever present with your servants who seek through art and music to perfect the praises offered by your people on earth and grant to them even now glimpses of your beauty and make them worthy at length to behold it unveiled forevermore. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Joining us this evening are two distinguished jazz musicians and two parishioners, themselves jazz aficionados. We have Rodney Whitaker, professor of jazz bass and director of jazz studies at Michigan State University, uh, with whom we've collaborated at Christchurch Cranbrook for several years now on jazz concerts and jazz masses. Troy Dostert is a contributor to jazz websites at All About Jazz and Free, the Free Jazz Collective. He's also an instructor of history at Cranbrook Schools. Sally Baldy is a parishioner and director of the Greater Detroit Jazz Society. And finally, Lanai Glenn McKinney is a Chicago-based saxophonist, uh, part of numerous jazz orchestras in the Midwest and Orlando, uh, a former student of, of Mr. Whitaker um, and who has played with us here and Rodney at Christ Church a number of times. As we get started with tonight's program, um, this is a, um, a webinar about music. So what better way than to, uh, to start listening to some music? Before, uh, before we got going, I asked our, some of our panelists if they'd like to, um, to talk about a specific piece of music. And this is, uh, this is a piece of music that, that Rodney Whitaker asked to play. It's, it's called Lonesome Lover by Max Roach and Abby Lincoln. Mr. Whitaker, it's great to see you tonight. Great to be here, Chris. You Christopher, know, excuse me. Yeah, you know, you know, this is uh, for the last four years. This has been uh, this upcoming weekend 
would have been the weekend which we would have collaborated on um, a jazz Pentecost mass. So um, I'm really uh, sorry that we're not going to be able to do that this year, but um, maybe this will take the place of it. Um, and it's just it's great to reconnect with you. Tell me a little bit about the song that uh, that you asked That's us to great. play. Well, this piece is uh, one that I fell in love with when I was a teenager. And uh, for me, jazz was a, a music that allowed me or, or gave me the opportunity to do a lot of reading and research and studying. And so that's how I really got, became literate as a, a young man. I fell in love with reading liner notes and books because of jazz. And this is one of the pieces that I covered when I was 15. And I wondered what was it about? And it on dual meaning, it's the double entendre and the, the, the duality of being African-American, but also being an African descendant. And so this, so what it, what it gave forward me the opportunity is to learn about at the end of colonial rule in the late fifties, African-Americans were dealing with their identity as African citizens or African descendants yet being American, but the duality of they're not treated fairly in America, but also they're not considered African. And so that's what this piece is really about. And um, again, for me, this was an important piece for my adolescence because it made me have to do research to understand the real meaning and the true meaning of the piece. And, it, and it's it's a pretty it's a pretty heavy heavy subject, but it's it's one of those things that the challenge one of the challenges we have as jazz lovers and jazz musicians and jazz uh, folks who appreciate jazz is that it is very difficult uh, to talk about jazz and not explore the subject of race. That's always a part of the subject, whether it's you know what we consider happy jazz, someone like Louis Armstrong. Uh, race is a part of that too, because he he smiled to be defiant. His smile was as powerful as someone's anger, and it was to be defiant against oppression, not, not to allow it to rob its joy. And so that is always the challenge that we have: is how do we present the music? How do we listen to the music? How do we talk about the music, and yet tackle the big subject? It, I think you make a great point, Rodney, and I, I wonder if you see your own role as a jazz musician today as continuing a voice of commentary on the political events of the day. I mean, have you seen yourself and the trajectory of your career as reflecting the kind of things that Max Roach was doing in the early 60s? Is that something you took to heart in your own identity as a musician? Well, I, I have as a musician, but I've also done it uh, because my philosophy is really Martin Luther King and that, that I reach out to communities all across the globe and I bring my message of love, hope, faith, faith and prosperity. And how do, we, how, do, how, do we all, how do we bring humanity? How do we talk about tough subjects? How do we also present the music from a joyful standpoint? And that's, that's always a challenge of um, when I when I was a kid, I think I because I grew up in an impressive community. I grew up in Detroit, which had a blockade. You know, like lock up, like it better or not. You know, if we went to a grocery store, we had to, there was one chain of stores. It was a Farmer Jack stores in Detroit. But most of the time, if you wanted fresh fruit or vet produce and vegetables, you had to go to another community. So that music of Charles Mingus, I actually did what you'll talk about later, but I. I actually did my, I listened to this music every day because it gave me hope and for liberation and freedom and all sorts of things. But as I grew up and I began to live and I began to have children and family, then I started liking what we I called as a teenager happy jazz because I didn't like Louis Armstrong and I didn't like trad jazz. I didn't like any of that. I like, I wanted to have something that I thought was dark and hardcore and had a political message but as I began to have hope and travel around the world and see people loving jazz and loving the identity of jazz musicians, I began to love, fall in love with Oscar Peterson and Sarah Vaughn and Ella Fitzgerald 
And so I think what I, my message is that you have to have a balance of pol politics and you have to have a balance of, me of the message of love because that's what Louis Armstrong was about. And that's what Duke Ellington was about. And I think it's also true that the, the music that resonates with us uh, at, at a different stage of our life, you know, I mean, th there's room for the whole gamut, you know, and there's, there's, there's certain kinds of jazz which took me a while to grow into. Um, and which still speak very powerfully to me, but then there's there, there's other moments. And I think the, the great thing about jazz music is that it's capacious enough to incorporate the whole range of human experience. Oh yeah. Um, so depending on what you're going through at a particular stage of your life, that you know you, you're you're going to find yourself going to certain artists more than others. Um, but it's all good. It is all good. I'm going to move on to um, to another song. Um, you, um, Sally Boley is who, a, a new friend of mine um, and just so uh, so excited to have you on on the program tonight you've um, you've encouraged us to listen to a piece um, called 13 fingers um, by the David Bennett um, and I'm uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna play this and I hope uh, and I hope as the technology uh, works with me I may have to turn it down so bear with me <laughs> on this transition I have two thoughts right off the bat with that piece, and the first is: is is that the kind the kind of happy jazz that Rodney was talking about? And what clarinetists get gold um, um, gold keys to play on? Well, Dave Bennett is a local clarinet. He's a prodigy, and he's a virtuoso. He's from the Waterford area. And he's pretty well known around this area now. His, when he was 13, his grandfather gave him a clarinet and a Benny Goodman record. And he fell in love with Benny Goodman. So he started playing swing and he's been playing professionally since he was probably 14. Um, th this particular piece, uh, he played at a coffee house in downtown Pontiac and the owner named him, called him 13 Fingers Bennett. So. He wrote this piece for his last uh, Mac Avenue record CD uh, with the Benny Goodman, Goodman flair to it. But I think it shows his technical expertise. He's really, um, he also plays piano and guitar and sings and he, he can do it all, but he travels all over the country, plays with symphony orchestras, uh, does Benny Goodman uh, events and he does, uh, rock events and he does uh, the largest festivals in the country. He's, he's a very busy, he does a lot of private events, but he plays nonstop around the country. And I thought um, for us in the Greater Detroit JS Society, he's a favorite because he's young. He, he has a master's degree in accounting. He is very devout. He's very religious and he, he wears his religion on his sleeve, which is very unusual for a 36 year old musician. But um, I chose him because he's, uh, he's special in this area. And in our, in our jazz society, we try to have all different kinds of jazz. We have big band and swing and a little bit of Dixieland. And um, he's a favorite with everybody. So we have, a little bit of everything for everyone. When you're um, um, when you're li listening to to music, or if you're or if you're producing a show and presenting a show, what are you hoping uh, the listeners will get out of it? We feel that we have about nine hundred members, and we we have a concert. We are a family. 
we, our people come in with a smile on their face and, you know, our result is a happy, a happy concert for us as promoters. My husband, Bill, and I run this organization is to just get the feedback at the end of the day. It doesn't matter, you know, who they are. We've learned to know who they really like to hear and what kind of music they like. It's basically standards for our group, um, big band and swing. But our happy day is when we have a full house. We always have a full house. And, you know, sometimes too full. We have a, a venue that doesn't allow us enough room for everybody that wants to attend. So it's always happy for us. It's our happy place. We'll move on. We talked a little bit early on about the, the, the social construct and the social context for, for music. Uh, Troy, you've, you've chosen a piece that, that certainly resonates uh, with you and with some of your teaching about that. Could you, before we listen to it, could you give us a little bit of an introduction to that? Right. So the, the piece that I selected is, is by Charles Mingus. <clears throat> um, and the original name of the piece was Fables of Faubus. Um, and it was first released in 1959 uh, on Columbia Records. Uh, the, the name of the album was Mingus Ah Um, which is one of the, uh, probably one of the greatest jazz records of all time. Um, and that version didn't include the lyrics, which Mingus had originally written in honor, so to speak, of Orville Faubus, the notorious Arkansas governor who stood in the way of the integration of Little Rock Central High School in 1957. So when when he wrote that piece, Columbia Records refused to let them uh, include the lyrics with it. Um, so that was the version that, that became famous. And then in 1960, um, the, the Candid record label uh, released it. Um, they had to revise the title a bit. So it was Original Fabus Fabus. Original Fabus Fables uh, is what they had to put on that record. And that includes the lyrics, which you will hear a portion of in this segment. And um, for me, uh, the reason I include this this uh, piece tonight is because it does play a role in uh, some of my teaching. One of the classes that I teach at Cranbrook Schools is a class on civil rights and race. And there's two pieces of music that I make sure that my students are introduced to each semester of that course, one of which is what you're about to hear, the, the Mingus piece. And the other is uh, a, a John Coltrane piece uh, called Alabama, uh, which in my mind is one of the most gorgeous pieces of music ever written. Um, and it was uh, dedicated to the four girls uh, in Birmingham who lost their lives in 1963 uh, when that church was bombed. And uh, for me, those two pieces are a way of introducing my students to how jazz spoke to that era, um, and both, both in, a, in a triumphal way, because I think when you listen to Mingus, there's a lot of defiance and a lot of rage and a lot of anger in that music. Um, and, and with Coltrane, it's, it's grief and sorrow in the most powerful form imaginable. Um, and, and the way in which jazz speaks to the human condition and the struggles uh, that African-Americans were going through in the 50s and 60s, that, that's the perfect way to capture that in a musical form for me. So anyway, that's why I chose the Mingus piece. going to ask for a few more bars because we only barely got to hear Eric Dolphy there. Um, the other reason I chose the piece is because uh, Eric Dolphy, one of my all-time heroes, uh, plays a brilliant 
alto sax solo on that piece, uh, which we got to hear about three seconds of. So, anyway. well, there's there, there's going to be some more saxophone playing when I get onto Lanai's piece. Yes, there is. Yes. Can we, Troy? Can I ask Troy a question? Yeah, please. Were you aware that the, the most the first civil rights person who spoke up on the behalf of civil rights and against Governor Farber's was actually Louis Armstrong. Yeah, um, I, I would love to hear more about that. If you so would tell what, us, Rodney. Yeah, one of the things that happened is in 56, it was negotiated that he would be the first jazz musician to do a tour for the U.S. State Department. And, uh, and that's an interesting uh, thing that there's a great book you can read about it. It's called Satchmo Blows Up the World. And it's all about the State Department tours, which were led by the great Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, uh, Duke Ellington Orchestra, and Dave Brubeck, and Dizzy Gillespie. And so in 50, so they, in 57, they, Louis Armstrong was supposed to do the tour. And because of Governor Farmers, he spoke out against it and refused to represent the United States. And he got a lot of criticism and heat behind it, but he stood his ground and didn't tour for the State Department until 58. And Dizzy, but, you know, as sort of like a consolation, Dizzy Gillespie ended up being the first person to do the State Department tours in 57. I, I, I think there's something so profound about the role that, that, that those musicians played um, in, in that period of American history. You know, um, there was a lot of hypocrisy yeah. uh, in, in America trying to promote this idealistic vision of democracy in a world where, you know, black people could not vote, didn't have basic civil rights uh, in the 1950s and 60s. And, and that needed to be pointed out at the same time. Um, what better way to introduce people to the best of American democracy than to have jazz musicians giving the world America's purest art form, right? I mean, uh, so, yeah. so the, the, the sacrifice that those musicians made in, in some cases, holding their tongue because there were certain yeah. things they weren't allowed to talk about when they went on those tours uh, for, for the State Department, but, but letting the music do the talking in a lot of ways. And I think the point that you made earlier, Rodney, about, uh, about Armstrong smiling, but there, there was, there was some, something underneath that smile, um, and, and it was a performance, and, and you knew it. And there, was a lot of, there were layers there um, in Armstrong that a lot of people who just saw the surface never quite appreciated. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. I didn't know that he was an outspoken critic of Fabus. That I did not know. Yeah, he was, he was the most outspoken mm -hmm. critic. And, and um, he lost a few gigs, but he was Louis Armstrong. So he, he uh, larger than life figure and people loved his music and they didn't punish him too badly. Mm. Um, I, I, I promised we'd go on to Lanai's piece. Um, and uh, I think you're you're in for a treat with um, with some more saxophone playing. Let me see if I can get this one up and going. I tell, us, tell us a little bit about yeah. <laughs> Well, from the piece I chose, I guess it's obvious that I love to feel music. <laughs> um, Kenny Garrett um, is a capstone figure in my life when it comes to music. Um, more or less Kenny Garrett, but a specific friend in college. Um, he introduced me to him and he was like, you'll love this cat, you'll love this cat. And I first heard him and I was like, I don't like it, I don't like it, you know? But then I listened to him again right after I transferred from one university to the next. And then I developed my ears a little bit more. And I was like, oh man, this is amazing. Because at that moment, I realized that my trans, my personal transition for how I identify with sound went from I hear sound to I hear specifics within sound. And it came less 
you know, from his general uh, playing, but more so from his approach to creating music. And from the larger standpoint, I'll talk about it from the top down. Um, Kenny Garrett approaches music from a very, I don't want to say, let's talk about it as a range approach. He approaches it from a very um, passionate point of, of, of building rhythms and building music and building all of his, his, his um, entire collaboration of everything comes out in such a way. I'm sorry, I'm very passionate about it. So like, like, let me get this articulation completely correct. Let me get it right, correct. Kenny Garrett was the first person to help me to understand that it is safe to have melodic music that was overheard, over rhythmic concepts that sung out to the world in such a way that identified with spirituality and everything in one whole. So for me, like I said, I chose this piece because not, not just this piece, but the entire record identifies with that. Awesome. Um, you know, the, the, the first thing that popped into my mind, I, I have to say it when I, when I saw that was, um, that looked to me kind of like your quintessential jazz uh, saxophonist. Um, yeah. And you are not, you're a trailblazer. <laughs> um, you're, um, so um, what, it, you know, tell us a little bit about your experience being a, um, a female jazz artist. Oh man, the, the door to being a female jazz artist is very, very interesting. Um, you have, what, on one end, you have the, all of the great and grand opportunities that it presents being unique. You know, people, you know, see you as being different to the usual, meaning like the, the general public, not the general public, but the general um, senses of jazz and, and everything is male dominant. And being around and being a part of that energy and people seeing that you're being different, it always creates an a, a, a instant look that's different. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty of what happens on the inside of everything, sometimes it creates its own adversities, meaning like you have, like right now, I'm a little bit nervous, I'll be honest with you. You have the personal you know, projection that happens um, naturally that you're supposed to uphold some standard that might seem impossible or you know, intriguingly unstoppable because you wanna make sure that you're maintaining the status quo but not creating a new status quo at the same time for being different. But at the same time, coming to all together, I feel like being a woman in this, in this and this field is is something that's just so magical. It's so beautiful. It's it's something that I get to I get to experience a piece of of this side of the light. You understand what I'm saying? That's so beautiful. Yeah. Thank thank you for all of that. Um, wow. Um, well done, ma'am. Um, I'm gonna maybe just use that as a as a little bit of a transition. You've so you've played uh, many times at Christ Church now, um, and maybe. Uh, maybe just offer offer two questions and you could start us off. Um, someone um, from our audience, well, I won't say someone, she's a very special someone. Her name is Pastor Manisha Dostert. She's asked this question, what is the relationship between jazz and Christian worship? So maybe you'd like to say a little bit about that. And, and also, is there a piece of music that you remember playing at Christ Church that's particularly, um, that you have a particular interest in? This is very interesting. So the cool part about playing in Christ is like, I've played so much, you know, in the few times, I think I've played there a total of four times. I've played so much music that it's hard to remember the specifics and take away from it. But every experience that I've had, everything has been an awe factor. It's been like, okay, I'm playing, you know, cause I grew, I grew up Christian. Um, I grew up actually in the Catholic church, but more so Christian than anything. And, and in my experience, I've, I've learned so much about, you know, traditional melody, traditional, traditional, all of these things in terms of approaching it from a musician's aesthetic. But being in the situations where we, we play this music from a, a formal jazz point and in collaboration with you guys' amazing choir, it's been, it's been really cool. So I can't give you like a specific unless you ask me about a specific, but overall, like I'm, I'm enjoying it. Great. Great, um, Rodney. We, um, I, I, I was introduced to you and uh, primarily as a um, as a performer um, of, of of jazz music, um, but you've been a part of um, cr uh, Christian worship uh, for your entire life. Well, yeah, I grew up um, originally in the Baptist Church in Detroit, and then as a teenager, I started playing at a sanctified church. And it was primarily because the pastor uh, pastor was driving a church band, band down the street and saw me with an upright bass and got pretty excited 
and invited me to join the band at the church. And so I switched as a teenager to Sanctified Church. And this was a church that only used acoustics. So they had two steel pedal guitars, harmonica, uh, piano, and, uh, uh, and three trombones and a choir. No, they didn't believe in plugging in. They thought that was of the devil. And then I joined a church at, a little later at 15 called Antioch Church of God in Christ, which is a Pentecostal church. But it was different because it was a Pentecostal church where we played traditional African-American gospel and hymns, but we also had a chamber orchestra. And so we played Scarlatti and Bach and, uh, and music from the European tradition because we had tons of classical music, well-trained classical musicians in the church. And so that, so that it was, it was for me a beautiful experience. So I was also exposed to European, uh, sort of European worship music as well as, as in African-American music and gospel and hymns. Mm -hmm. And then at uh, maybe, I think I was maybe like 38 years old, my wife and I became co-music ministers at a church in Lansing. And we did that for about five years, which is the toughest job on earth to be a music minister at a church primarily because there's tons of services and um, your faith gets tested. What That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 do you what do you think about the relationship of, uh, of jazz and Christian worship? Well, I think jazz grew up in the church. It's all, all music from African-American culture sort of incubated in the church early out in the, in the history. That was the place and Sundays where slaves were able to play. And then from there, the music grew out, grew out of the gospel traditions in church. Um, also too, when you think about uh, John Coltrane and many of the players, improvisation, that improvisational aspect comes out of the black church. For example, in the African Methodist tradition, which John Coltrane comes out of, you line a hymn. So you, you would take a text and you would improvise and you would sing. And it could be it could be the Lord's Prayer and you could make up your own melody and improvise. And in fact, to the point that the piece of Love Supreme or actually Alabama that you mentioned, Troy, is actually written from the text of, of Martin Luther King's eulogy for the four black girls. And so that was that tradition is steeped in the church. And my pastor used to say, um, he used to he used to always remark that the the only difference between jazz and gospel music is that jazz was played in the club and gospel was played in the church. Yeah, one of my teachers, uh, Don Saliers, used to talk about the um, like the commingling of the Saturday night crowd and the Sunday morning crowd. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> And how and how those you know you know after a time on Saturday night it becomes Sunday morning right you know and it, and it, it, they begin to you know join join together like that I think there's I mean we've, we've touched on a lot of a lot of <clears throat> interesting thoughts about this this connection between um, uh, between music and and you know Christianity and the, and and spirituality maybe in general. I think um, there's some sense that 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 jazz, as a particularly soulful uh, work and and music, you know, sort of encompasses humanity at, at full stretch, right? We've talked about the stretch from happiness to to sadness to despair, and I wonder what um, and, and and some of our, our 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 listeners are wondering what our response or what is the response of jazz at this time? How do we listen to jazz music um, at this time uh, during, during the pandemic? And what, what perhaps is the, is, is the future of, of, of music at this time, both at the university level for you, Rodney and Sally at the, at the promotional level? Um, how, how is jazz able to speak to us perhaps during this time? Well, I'm very excited to see how creative the musicians have become. I'm loving the live stream things. You know, every day there, there's a whole new list of live stream music going on that 
is allowing not only the musicians to perform, but to collect some money. They can, they can, you know, get paid through PayPal and other various ways like that. But um, for Christ Church, when you see the choir doing virtual choir performances and you see virtual jazz bands, and I think it just shows the number one, we're so lucky to have this technology today, but it really is inspirational for those of us who can't wait to have live jazz again, to be able to see it in just in a different way on our computer every day. But we still see the people we love, the musicians we love, and we know our fans are out there willing to pay to, to see it. Well, you know, the thing is, I, I think that I, I had a conversation two days ago we went to Marcellus and seeking his counsel and advice. He's actually in New York City, the chairman of the Louis Armstrong Foundation. And they were able to give a million dollars away to local musicians in, in New York City. So they gave 800 musicians about $1,200 a piece to help them. And uh, so I would love to see some sort of initiative in Metro Detroit because Musicians have contacted me daily and they're struggling. Um, most of them were, people are trying to do innovative things, but that's not really, not to Sally, not to, uh, I think I'm, I, I appreciate like you the innovation and I'm inspired to want to do more, but I'm getting calls from people saying, you know, we don't, we don't want to do it for free, but it's it would be nice to have some support because, you know, the musicians, you know, we get paid by the volume. And if there are no gigs, there is no volume. And uh, I would love to see there be the foundation support in Metro Detroit to support the musicians. And the thing to remember, Detroit is the jazz city. Everybody say New Orleans, but I can argue that there are many, as many world-class players. I mean, a guy like Dave Bennett or Paul Keller or mm -hmm. Randy Gillespie or Randy Napoleon. Uh, I mean, there's tons of world-class musicians right in our community and people need support. But I, I agree with Sally 100%, the innovation that's coming from this. Musicians are trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure out how to monetize their performances. And they're also, people are being creative, you know? And uh, many of us are blogging. We're, we're putting together every night, you should look on Facebook of all the creative playlists. People are putting up tunes every night to help you get through the pandemic. So it's, it's a beautiful time for creativity, but it would be nice to see the support to be there for, this is our national treasure. It's wonderful. I'm just gonna um, in, interrupt a, a little bit and just remind everyone um, in the audience um, to, um, to uh, if you have any questions uh, that you'd like answered, we're gonna uh, in, in a few minutes start to go into a question and answer period. So I know we have a couple um, uh, a couple questions that have already come in that we'll certainly get to, but uh, if you have questions, write them down now um, in the Q and A uh, box, and we will we will get to them. Sorry, back to you, Nathan. Yeah, um, Troy, are, are you listening to jazz or differently these days, or or how are you how are you able to listen? What are you listening to, and how is that moving you? Well, as, as a teacher of history and, and, and imagining this time as a, from a historical perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the amount of jazz that's still being recorded and played. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of us felt that especially, you know, the last few months that things would really taper off. Um, but I'm, I'm receiving just as much music as ever uh, to be reviewed, more music than I can listen to, honestly. And it's of really consistently high quality you know um i mean this is partly a tribute to the work that that folks like rodney are doing um there are a lot of well-trained jazz musicians in this country you know and and it, it it gives me hope that the music is in really good hands um and there are still uh lots and lots of young people committed to playing it and they're resilient you know i mean uh it is not an easy career to embark upon and if anybody's equipped to come out of this victorious uh it would be it would be jazz musicians you know you, you don't you don't go into this line of work thinking you're going to make a lot of money it's not a lucrative choice um it isn't for any musician but i think jazz musicians have a particularly challenging time of it 
So um, the fact that there, there are so many people just, you know, just, just continuing to fight along and, um, and make it through this, uh, I, I take a lot of hope from that, definitely. I, could I speak to Lanai for just a moment? Please. Please do. I am so inspired by what you said about our, our women musicians. We have some of the finest women musicians in the Detroit area, as you know. Some of the yes. bands we hire for our jazz concerts are all women. Um, we have one uh, recently, Carrie Price, who's a, who's a blues vocalist, but she's hired several all girl, all women bands. And um, we, have, we have some really fabulous women musicians and it, it's, it's so great to see. It's always been a man's game. And yeah. I loved hearing what you said. Yeah, yeah. Forgive me if I'm being a little too transparent, but it's the reality. You know, it's the reality we live in. And we fight hard. And when we come with it, we come to play, you know? So yeah, it's great. It was great <laughs> to hear you say that so eloquently. Yeah. Keep blazing that trail. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to just offer um, offer an initial question to start start things off, I'm, and I'm going to give you a little background to uh, to this one. Um, this question comes from Nathaniel Bell, who we call Nate. Um, he's one of our choristers, our treble choristers. He's in seventh grade, and um, we actually just had a, a Zoom um, rehearsal with them this afternoon. So uh, it, it inspires me that he's that he's watching this webinar and. Um, and looking into this. So his question is, um, what decade was jazz in its full swing? And this is a chorister who loves puns. So I'm sure that he put swing in there for a reason. <laughs> well, you know, the if I can take that a bit of that, the most popular period of jazz is from about 1934 to about 1955. And that's really the swing era. And uh, the swing era, and it's really sort of almost the longest period of jazz. Um, when you look at the amount of music and things that were that were uh, recorded, and the other thing to think about is that all popular music at that time was in based in jazz, and not, not all of it was considered jazz. So there's distinctions between big band swing and jazz. Some 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 folks jazz had to have a certain amount of improvisation to be considered jazz. Uh, and then many of the, the great people like Benny Goodman and Ellington and all those folks would do recordings that were specifically for dance music and were on the hip parade. And then they would do more improvised things. But that, so that certainly from about 30, 1934, and we can even venture back to say 29, that's when Paul Whiteman's band started. So let's go 1929 to 50, let's go 54. Nate I, Nate, I hope that I hope that answers your question. Can I can I say something in regards to this? I, I agree with you wholeheartedly historically. Um, Prof, I'm, I call him Prof because I'm still always <laughs> pulling back from our MSU days. But I agree wholeheartedly. But I think that uh, jazz is the answer is yes to that question. Jazz is constantly the most co popular, common, and, and greatest concept of music that's ever being used. Like everything that we do on every, I don't care what you listen to, whatever you bring it up, I can identify personally, you know, 20 aspects. And I don't consider myself to be the most intelligent person on the planet, but I can identify at least 20 aspects of what's happening within that music that comes specifically from the jazz mm -hmm. idiom. So the answer is like, jazz is still the most common music across all eras. It's just not necessarily identified as such because we've taken our own different, um, Oh, labels, so to speak, mm -hmm. <laughs> labels of what different, um, I guess you say, genres of music are. I think I think part of the problem is that um, you know what differentiates the swing era from from the bebop era. When here we're talking about the fifties and and sixties, is is that you know it, it the cliche is that it's it became a musician's music. Uh, it was no longer the popular music that that was easy to dance to. Um, that was you know I, calling it simpler is a little bit misleading because it was not simple music um but the music that charlie parker was playing and that monk was playing in dizzy gillespie that was that was complicated music and took a lot of work and i i think you know one one of the challenges that we face in the 21st century is that since our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and our ability to lock in 
and really focus on a piece of music and just give it our full attention. If you're not able to do that with bebop, you're not going to get it. That is not easy listening music. You can't just put that on in the background and, and, you know, just do something else. You got to be devoted to it. And this is, I think the challenge that, that we face is to figure out, you know, we got to, you got to commit to the music, I think, to really appreciate the music on the level that, um, that Lanai is talking about. And, um, you know, this is my cranky teacher voice yes. here, but uh, mm. when, when I'm when I'm working with my students, it is hard. It is hard. And I, I couldn't play that entire Mingus piece to my students because by two or three minutes, they, they start talking to each other. You know, they're 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 I'm losing them all together because there isn't a video to go with it. You know, they want to they, they well, can't you bring up a video of them playing it? Why do you need a video? Can't you just listen to it? Um, you know, and. So, but I'm guilty of this too. You know, my own attention span is, is, yeah, is, is yeah. not getting longer uh, as I get older. So, I, you know, it, I, I think it demands something of the listener, this music, uh, to really appreciate it in its depth. And, um, you know, it, it, the rewards are there, but you, you, yeah. have to, you have to bring that commitment to the music. And, and I think that's just, uh, that's hard for people. They don't necessarily see that in the music that they're listening to. Music is, is, is background, you know, um, it's something you do while you're doing something else. And that's well, hard. You know, you know the, the thing to remember also, too, is that if you if you promote anything, it could be popular. And what happened with jazz is we created teenage culture in the late 50s. And so record companies sort of market themselves towards teenage promoting and selling recordings to teenagers. Mm -hmm. And so that's music. Rock and roll became popular. Rhythm and blues, rock and roll and then rock into the 1960s. And everything was about getting that teenage consumer's dollars. Even Motown music, which I love, um, was the, the, the music of, of, the young, of young Americans, the way they marketed themselves, because they realized that that was a consumer market that would buy recordings. That's the biggest generation, of baby boomer generation is the biggest generation. So that's a lot of dollars to make selling recordings but you can actually make anything popular if you promote it we have a couple of questions in our in our chat that are sort of asking like like the, the, the maybe the tough question like what is jazz um what what makes jazz jazz um you know other artists you know uh, some artists sound different from others you know, maybe even what's what's the what's the dynamic between composition and and improvisation in jazz? Um, maybe Rodney and Lanai, you can speak you can speak to that, and then maybe as as as, as listeners, Sally and Troy, you can also also respond as well. You said the dynamic between improvisation and composition. Yeah, well, and 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 what is what is distinctive about jazz? If I you know. Again, I'm, I'm I'm taking another question, but if I'm coming at this new, what am I listening for? What do you you talked about the the evolution of your yeah, life. yeah. I mean, I guess I kind of relates back to my, you know what I was talking about originally with the Kenny Garrett piece. For me, I've always been personally insecure because I grew up in the church. You know, I have a, like a strong as as much as I I'd love to not admit, but I do have a strong gospel. <laughs> gospel root I still have a strong Catholicism root I still have a I have a strong root in the church in different um, essence and I still at the same time in, indulge heavily in R&B and this is just me talking about all of the million things that goes on in my mind when it comes to music in general and then when I came into jazz you know it was it was at um my entrance to you know a university for university um setting that I started to realize like okay jazz is considered to be something that is filed into a specific aspect of life and the way that I identify identify with it now to determine like okay this is definitely jazz is the complexity the complexity of the melodic content the complexity of the rhythmic context the complexity of the uh harmonic context the complexity of the context of all of that and it doesn't mean that there's more notes it doesn't mean that there's less notes it doesn't mean that there's more rhythm happening it doesn't mean that there's less rhythm it means that you can listen on layer after layer after layer and still find something new and, and I know that's like probably overgeneralizing uh, understanding of something, but for me, this is what it's come to be. And I, I don't think that it's something that we can identify specifically as uh, end of all. I think it's a journey to, uh, to an understanding of what jazz is. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Can, can you yeah. help me out a little bit there, Rodney? 
for me, for me, I, I spend a lot of time in Detroit. I used to play with a, a trumpet player named Charles Victor Moore. And Charles Victor Moore was a member of the McKinney Cot Pickers, which is one of the first national famous jazz groups from Detroit. We had the Gene Goldkite Orchestra and uh, McKinney Cotton Pickers. And that group, Charles Victor Moore was in that group. And when I played with him, I was 18 and he was 82 or 83 years old. And his, his thing was jazz was music that 90% of the component of the music is based on improvisation. So if you look at how little we play a melody yeah, on a okay. song, most of jazz is all about improvisation. And they had distinctions between what was not what was jazz and what wasn't jazz. So if you take uh, Chattanooga Choo Choo by uh, Glenn Miller Orchestra, yeah. that's not jazz. Because the main, and it had elements of improvisation in it, but it was really about the lyrics and all that sort of stuff, and it's not jazz. We might argue that today because it has elements of jazz, but they were strict. If you had like a little short eight bar solo, it's not jazz. But if jazz was 90% of the music, then it's jazz. Improvisation so, is not. So it's really so, about improvisation. So you still like, you still believe that it's still primarily focused on improvisation? You don't uh, think that well, like the other. Jazz, it's not jazz without improvisation. Absolutely. But like if the then improvisation is limited. If it's limited to like and just a certain it, point, it's not jazz. That's what Vic Charles Victor Moore told me. That's that's deep. That's deep. That's deep. I can't say I agree or disagree. Because that's because deep. if you if you take a blues song, it has improvisation in it. A lot. And it's and usually of it. short. It's usually short. Really? Yeah, it's a chorus. I'm thinking it's about. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about like every time a blues vocalist says something and then they respond with well, some they're kind improvising. of you know they they are improvising. But it's not jazz. Jazz is mm. something very specific. Now that doesn't mean along the way we didn't borrow rhythms and take things from other music, but jazz is a very specific intent. And jazz is played by people all over the world. You don't actually have to be African American or white American. You could be from Brazil and play jazz. It is very distinct. Like uh, you take Sergio Mendez in in uh, 1965 before he started Brazil 66, he was a jazz pianist playing Brazilian music. And then he <laughs> wanted to do a commercial project and started a vocal group and he wasn't playing jazz anymore because it wasn't about improvisation. I did. I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to in, in, insert here. There was, uh, there, there was um, not a question, but a, um, a comment that said, I just want Rodney and Lanai to know uh, to know that the music you have that you bring to Christchurch Cranbrook is a phenomenal blessing to us. Every time you play, I sit my children right up in front so we can watch you in awe, gratitude and delight. Thank you for enriching our worship and our world. And I, um, I, I certainly second that. Um, interesting question, um, and and I actually may respond, but I, I'd, I'd, I'd like one of one of our jazz are um, um, more, more of our jazz experts to answer this. It's, um, I love classical music. How do I relate to and understand jazz? Go ahead, Pops. Sorry. We all can teach Troy. I, I, this, is, this is something I can speak to because um, I, I grew up studying classical music. Uh, I was classically trained on piano. I studied for about six, seven years, classical piano. And I had an opportunity to play in my high school jazz ensemble uh, sophomore year. And um, uh, I blew it because uh, even though even though I, 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 I did it, I did it one year and then I quit. And the reason why I quit is because I couldn't do it. I mean, at the at the end of the day, I just knew uh, and we get back to the, the, the this is the issue, right? It's improvisation. Uh, and I could play the notes on the page, but I could not for the life of me figure out what to do with the jazz chart. You know, when, when, when the band director gave me these charts, and, and, and for those of you who are not jazz musicians, right, it's just letters on the page with some occasional numbers. You know, I'd try to figure out what a G7 was. G7, what, the, what, what is this? And I wanted everything to be written out. And I asked them, I said, is there any way that we could just get it all written out? Because I can play it. <laughs> the notes are all on the page. I'll, I'll do just fine. And he refused, of course, as any principal jazz director would do, right? And I, I just, you know, all I ended up doing was memorizing about four or five licks 
And anytime it was my turn to solo, it was the same four or five licks every single time, you know, and everybody was more or less indulgent. You know, it's like, okay, I guess that's as good as he's going to do. So whatever, you know, and I could kind of keep rhythm, you know, I could more or less do a little comping here and there, but it was kind of pathetic. Um, and at the end of the day, I could not get past the need for the notes on the page. And so for me, uh, it, it ultimately, it's, it, it, you have to appreciate the freedom that, that goes into jazz performance. And I think that's true whether you're playing it or whether you're listening to it. Um, you have to suspend a lot of your preconceptions in order to appreciate a lot of jazz musicians because they are doing stuff that is pretty out there. Um, and if you go into it expecting that the music's going to have a certain structure and a certain form and that it's going to be kind of safe, because you know what you're getting into. Um, then I think invariably uh, you, you, get, you get frustrated by that. So you, you, a certain degree of open-mindedness, I think, is really essential. Um, just to suspend what you think you might be getting and let the music's emotional power hit you because it's there in huge quantity, right? Um, but I think, uh, you know, for those of us that's, that have only been exposed to classical music, this is really hard um, to, to really appreciate the freedom that is in a good jazz performance. That's my take yeah. on it. I oh, I definitely love to jump in and piggyback on what you said. I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that you said, but I would also say that the uh, the the true key to transcending or 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 transferring, you know, your classical approach to your jazz approach is is oral training. Like what you listen to, it's one thousand percent what you listen to, and you pro providing yourself with uh, a, an amazing stream of different understandings of what this is really truly rooted in you know for me and and being able to explain it you know theoretically it would be like finding ways to capture the triplet feel but being and that's you know we're talking about swing but being able to explain it outside of theoretically like it's 1000 percent about what you listen to like if you're only listening to classic classical music and you want to approach you know whatever jazz piece that you have and you want to you can you can you can have all of these different understandings of what you think it is, but if you haven't really submerged yourself into hearing and listening to, or being able to, uh, j just like we, you know, we often compare music in general to a baby that learns to speak. You know, if you learn to speak with a certain accent, you'll have that accent, but can you learn other accents? Absolutely. You know, it's about how much you expose yourself to those other accents. So yes, you are 1000% correct, but also the oral aspect, yes. I just I, I have a um, I feel like I can sympathize just a little bit with uh, with this question because um, before I uh, before I came the director of music at Christchurch Cranbrook my my experience with jazz was um, was extremely limited um, and I um, and I was encouraged to uh, w when I came to the Detroit area to to take this up a little bit and. Um, and and see where see where it would lead our congregation and I I tried to open my mind and uh, and uh, and understand and and be willing to to learn and I think I think what I've learned is that um, while oftentimes jazz can be um, presented in a casual setting it's not always presented in a casual setting um, it's high art. Um, it's just it's high art and it's authentic art. Um, and um, I maybe just follow up on Lanai and say, or maybe, or maybe Troy said, um, you know, try to try not to have um, to set your expectations and tr and try to equate it to um, to classical music. Open yourself up to the experience and know that it's high art. Get yourself some good jazz, um, and you're going to have a, an amazing experience. And, and there are gateway artists that can help with this. You know, one, one of the first groups that I really came to love is the Modern Jazz Quartet. And they embodied the third stream, which was an attempt to bring jazz and classical into a conversation. And uh, even to the point where they always wore tuxedos, you know, when they performed, because they wanted it to be clear that this was high art. And um, listening to some of those performances, which uh, really have a certain classical majesty to them, at the same time that they're swinging, at the same time that the, the roots of the music are there, it's in the blues, but, but, but you can also hear the classical resonance. And they absolutely believed, uh, as a lot of jazz musicians have, that the, these worlds are not polar opposites. Um, you know, the, 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 the ability for cross hybridization uh, is, is definitely there with the music. And I, that's one of the reasons why I love it is because it is so hard to pin down exactly what jazz is. And part of that is because 
it's amorphous. It's always growing. It's always evolving. Um, and, uh, and, and that's one of the terrific things about it. You know, there's more to be said. There's always more to be said. Well, the thing I can add to that is that the thing, the thing that learn if you're a musician that's versed in classical music or Baroque or any of the styles, the typical thing that you understand usually is form. And pretty much all of the forms that we play in jazz come out of European music. So whether it's the AABA form or the AA, uh, AABB sonata allegro form, all of the forms come out of European music, whether we're playing a traditional 16 bar hymn with a verse and a chorus, um, they all come, everything that we do come out of the European tradition. And so if you understand that, the thing to think about in jazz is that we're creating improvisational variations to the melody. And so if you could always hear the song in your head, then you don't get lost. And that's, you know, that's the way I learned to like jazz and to understand jazz in the beginning. And then later as you evolve and your taste evolve, then you begin that we begin to break the form. We, so we learn the forms and then in our avant-garde music, we could not play the form. We didn't have to play in time. There's some other things. But I would also like to add, it's also great to go to the record stores because I learned about what to listen to in the jazz store. We used to have a store in Detroit called Sam's Jams. And all of the old heads, so to speak, used to school me growing up and telling me what records to buy, and who to listen to, and who is hip and who's not hip. And there's tons of great record stores. I won't give a commercial, but there's tons of great record stores in Metro Detroit to buy records and uh, and to just have conversations with the, with the, the older uh, aficionados. They'll kind of guide you to what to listen yeah. to and how to listen. Yes, that's exactly what I was trying to say by R.O., it's an oral skill, like, yes, 1000%. Like the best way to learn is by actually submerging yourself into what's happening. And, re and in some, it's gonna be something that relates to you great. It's just like he explained, like if you understand AABA or if you understand a, 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 a melody all the way throughout a song very well, as you break away from it, or as you, as you hum it and you change just one pitch, you're already entering the world of improvisation. As you, and then you, the next time you sing it, you, you might change two pitches, you know, or, or whatever the case may be it's all coming from you having a, a very rooted understanding of what the original content is. And, and that comes from you submerging yourself into the records that, you know, whatever, whatever it is that sings to you that helps you relate to it, the greatest, but I, yes. Yeah, Sally, do you, as a leader of an organization that deals with both jazz and blues and, and swing, you know, can you maybe, you know, speak to that as to how you, how you, how you approach your, your uh, the understanding of your group's work. We, uh, we have some very knowledgeable members in our organization. And I think that's one thing that, that we like to do. We like to hear what, what other people want to hear. You know, they're, they're very knowledgeable and astute about groups they, they like to hear. So we, we try to reach out to those groups um, and offer, you know, what, what people like. We don't just offer what we like, but there's, there's a complexity in, in the following of jazz and it means different things to different people, so. Yeah, and that oral experience, you know, seems to be far, in, far reaching. Yeah, that you have. As a promoter, we, we really don't make any money, but we have to listen to who our audience wants to hear. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, we've had so many groups that we have had to, you know, not have perform. I was counting up the other day how many musicians have lost work through our events that aren't happening right now. And it, it's stunning. Um, you know, we can't wait to get back as soon as we can. If it's a 50% full room and social distancing with the band, a quartet, or, you know, the smaller groups are just gonna have to do that. But um, we, just, we just need live jazz in our life and our, and our audience does too. I'm, I, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to jump in here and, um, and we're gonna start to cl close things up a little bit. Reminds me, um, uh, 
so much music, so little time. We could go, we could go on with, with this for, uh, for, for many more episodes. Um, I really want to thank our, our panelists tonight, Sally and Troy and Rodney and Lanai. Um, it's been really wonderful to connect tonight and thank you so much for sharing, um, sh sharing your part of the jazz world with everyone. Um, thank you, Christian. Yeah, thank before, you. Thank and you. Before we before we go, we just like an opportunity to um, if anyone wants to uh, to have a little share out about um, things that are near and dear to your heart, I'll go ahead and just say um, anyone who's watching tonight, check into ChristChurchCranbrook.org. There's a church at home page that you can go to where you can find out about all of our upcoming upcoming events. In fact, we have um, we have one tomorrow at 7 p.m. It's called won't be music related, but it's called Rebuilding the Economy Post-COVID-19. And that's at 7, uh, 7 p.m. and hosted by Father Danaher. Um, and if you're looking for another music webinar, we're having another music webinar on Tuesday, June 30th. Tuesday, June 30th at 7 p.m. when we're going to host um, a program on another king of instruments. We normally think of the organ as the king of instruments, but <laughs> perhaps a larger instrument is the carillon. <laughs> Our 50, our 50 bell um, instrument that lives in the tower at Christ Church Cranbrook. So um, stay tuned Tuesday, uh, June 30th for that. Um, anyone else like to like to add uh, add something along those lines? Well, I'll be doing a Father's Day uh, concert online uh, on YouTube and on it'll be YouTube live, but also I think it's going to be uh, broadcast on the web stream on public television in Detroit and uh, the jazz radio station in Detroit, and it'll be live in my dining room. My daughter and I will do a duo concert. Oh, to nice, very exciting, nice, yes. So can you just say that once again, and how would we find that on uh, on YouTube? Well, it'll, it'll be, uh, I'll, I'll put it out on social media, and then I'll also ask you all to share. That'd probably be the easiest way. Great. Sally? I'm, I'm also on the board of the Michigan Jazz Festival, and um, that occurs every year at Schoolcraft College. We normally have uh, 6,000 people that come through and seven stages and 40 bands, and we just had to cancel that. But um, we also have a Father's Day brunch event, which will be on our website and Facebook on Father's Day with um, um, a great program, just an hour-long program. It's a fundraiser for Michigan Jazz Festival. And Watch Greater Detroit Jazz Society .com. We'll we'll be back open soon with all of our events. I promise. Great, Troy. Uh, I would just urge everybody to uh, remember the artists uh, during this difficult time, and if you get a chance to to buy music, buy it. Um, Bandcamp is a great resource for a lot of independent musicians that are coming up, and um, gives them an opportunity to get some compensation for their art. Um, I would also echo Rodney's point about record stores. I hope we have some left uh, after the COVID epidemic is over because um, it is such a great resource to be able to go into a brick and mortar store and explore new music. Um, so when you get a chance, and I'm gonna be there as soon as I get a chance uh, to, to, to support the artists that are making the music because without them, this doesn't happen. Download their music. Yes. Go to your favorite musician's website and download their music. Yes. Great. And Lenai? Everybody has said so much. Yes. Yes to everything that has been said. Um, I'm personally doing a live stream tomorrow with a, um, a group. It's more R&B and soul, but there will be lots of improvisation. I don't know where if you want to draw the line of what you think jazz is. <laughs> no offense <laughs> to promote anything in the wrong way. But um uh, yes, like 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 everybody has said, like please support support artists in, in in any way you can. You know, support record stores because that is where we start to you know breed the right understanding and interpretation of everything. I think I'll only add to Christopher's point that all of our webinars are available on the Christchurch Cranbrook YouTube um, page, including this um, including this webinar when we're when we're finished. We'll also put up the links to the music uh, that we played tonight, so you can listen to them in their entirety and hear what our illustrious panel um, is listening to these days or is talking about tonight. Um, so we'll, we'll close in prayer. Keep watch, dear Lord, 
with those who work or watch or weep this night. To give thine angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous. And all for thy love's sake. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone. Thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.